You were so good. You got to be on the Ellen Show. Hi, Peter. Oh, no. Welcome to another episode of African Speak Series. Stories from around the world. Our guest today is a, a great African man. All the way from the soccer Zambia. Mr. <laughs> Lee Madre in the house. Woo -woo. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to the show, Mr. Limata, aka Storytime with Mr. Limata. What inspired you to start Storytime with Mr. Limata? Oh, wow. Um, it's really just the pandemic, you know, like when the shutdown happened and they're like, well, what am I going to do? I was looking for some kind of continuity for the class, you know, and um, things that we do in the classroom that are hard to replicate you know, like a distance. And so I thought, well, stories are always a favorite. They're always, you know, there's always that buzz around them in the class. Whether I'm reading an African folk tale, whether I'm reading, you know, just a silly book from, you know, like an author in the US, anywhere, it's just kids just seem to gravitate and love it. And so I was like, let me try that. And then also one of the things that I looked at was access. What sort of access would students have to this to, you know, like to what platform would be good for that. And I looked at it and thinking, well, if I did email or anything, like some parents might not get to it, but if you use things like Facebook, every parent has an email uh, or has a, you know, a Facebook, a phone that yeah. they can link yeah. on. So, yeah, yeah. Very nice. <laughs> and you were so good. You got to be on the Ellen Show. Wow. <laughs> Well, that that was a surprise, I'm sure, as yeah. you saw too. No, yeah, it was yeah. an absolute surprise. And um, I think when you look at, you know, getting such recognition was honestly like just so affirming and like, oh, this is what we're doing is so important. And especially when it's reading with children, you know, you want them to grow that love for reading and to continue also having access even in times like this. So it was an absolute honor. And um, yeah, just, just, you know, like I think it speaks volumes to the relationship that I have with my students. And I think that's what everybody kind of tapped into when they were able to see that relationship that we have that was could be seen on the screen but also you know like just spoke of how how much we, how close we were even in the in the classroom yeah, yeah. so <laughs> beautiful beautiful and why did you leave lusaka um it was actually for a girl <laughs> really <laughs> Literally, okay. yeah so i met somebody and then um so it was um yeah initially it was just you know, after we met in Zambia and then um, she, just, she was just finishing off her Peace Corps at the time. And then, well, we ended up staying in the Saka for three, three and a half years. And then at that time came and she was like, well, I, I want to go back to school. And so um, at that point, like, I mean, what do you do? Your partner wants to go to school and you can't do anything. So we're just like, OK, let's let's try out this US thing. And so that's how I came back. Cause she's from here. And so that's how we came over and initially just came to just check it out I was very hesitant because everything was pretty much done back home so and then yeah so when I came out and then yeah everything just, just moved along from there wow. that is <laughs> yeah. <beautiful. laughs> this is the first time because it's always the women leaving for the men but this is the first time right I'm right like... no no absolutely. yeah no yeah, that's nice that's wonderful uh, what was the culture shock you had when you just came to America Oh, that was, that was a lot. And just, I think the biggest one for me was, you know, coming here and realizing, oh, I had, I had to do more school. And already I'd been to college in Zambia and, you know, I had a job and had, you know, a business that I was running and all this. And so it was just really hard to move here and then be all of a sudden like, oh, you need to do this. Your papers don't really translate, you know, like, right. don't, yeah, after sending them to the, um, the credentialing office like you need to do this and that and so yeah that that part not much a culture shock but just like just that realization of like oh my goodness like i have to go to school and then yeah. there's you know but then there were things too when just in zambia we're so close as you know with african culture you're close your neighbors your friends like i know everybody in my in my in my neighborhood you know yeah. like you, yeah. you go outside you know there's the souls and souls at this place this family there like you can stop by any time you don't have to call friends to set up you know meetings and stuff and then just being out here and realizing like i'm in this apartment unit and i have, I have no idea who my neighbors are so yeah, that was hard. That yeah. was really hard. Yeah, and yeah, adjusting. And then also 
paying to play sports. Oh, okay. That was our prison <laughs> time. You're like, we have teams you go and teams who actually may pay you to play. But right. you, you play with your friends in the neighborhoods and so on. It's just like you go to a field and you play first come, first serve, right? Yeah. But then here, yeah, it was like, oh, to use the parks, to use it because you have to pay. And so, yeah. what's going on? And, you know, when you're coming in, you know, like you realize that the sort of jobs you're doing in your first time are not, you know, like maybe the best thing. So you realize, oh, I have to pay for this and that. And yeah, so. So definitely a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> what is the cost of living in, in Oakland, California like? Oh, as, as, as you know, the Bay Area is among the, the areas with the highest cost of living. It is, it is, um, it is quite expensive. An apartment, a one bedroom apartment, for example, you know, you're looking at 1,600, you know, like around there or more dollars. So it, it depends on where you are. You have a lot of people who are um, sharing apartments, sharing a house and maybe each one having their bedroom and so on. So it's like those little, those things, definitely. It, it's high. Um, vegetables, you know, like it's so hard to, to get those and um, yeah, you pay a little more. And just things like, even just like I was saying, if you want to like really pay attention to exercise at times, you have to, you know, join those like soccer groups or whatever, you have to pay a little something. But the weather is worth it. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like the most about life in California as, as an African? As an African, I think, um, well, in Auckland in particular, would be um, just the diversity. Like when you come in as an African, there's, you know, you see so many. Yes, they might not all be your friends. You might not all hang out, but just knowing there's people like me and then just seeing too, like there's a very big um, African-American population. So that also really helps because then you see so many people around that look like me that have had struggles. Yes, struggles that I may not at times um, completely understand, but I understand. And somebody who looks at me and feels that I, I understand their struggle and they understand mine. So just, yeah, looking around and seeing that and just seeing people from all over the world. And, um, and of course, just uh, like seeing the opportunities that are there at times, especially in terms of education, the, the funding that goes into whether it's, you know, like student loans. So, yes, you end up with a student loan, but you still have the opportunity to be in school. So I feel like that, that has been a, yeah, those have been huge, huge parts for me. Yeah. So what do you not like? Ooh, <laughs> um, in terms of my profession and just, uh, I, I work at a title one school, you know, like that means schools that where like my school right now, is 75, over 75 percent of the students qualify for free and reduced lunch. So it means that, you know, like basically poor, poor kids, poor families earning below a certain income. Um, and you know, like the things, the programs that we have at my school, for example, we're, we're lacking some. We've, we've we've not had a stable like PE program in the whole time I've been there. This is my sixth year there. We've we've you know like we've we had to raise money to, to keep our librarian last time, mm -hmm. and so like so many little things. Our arts program is not really developed, and so on. So there's so many things that we lack as a school. And then you go eight minutes up in the hills, a school nearby with wealthier families. They have so much more. So why that? How do we expect our children to develop? How do we expect them, you know, like, and, and most of the times it ends up being students of color, you know, black and brown students being affected the most. They're the ones that come to those schools. See? So that part really, um, really affects me. I do not like that. And then, of course, um, yeah, sometimes I miss I miss food back home. So and just like a uh, little things like <laughs> the chima, you know, like we're making chima here. It's not quite yeah. the same. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Never the and same. Then, Never yeah, the same. and then I can't get there's a fish we call buka fish, buka buka fish back home. I can't get that here. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for sharing that. So, what advice would you give to any African who wants to move to America? Um. You know, like everybody's situation is different. Like people move in so many different ways. Some, you know, like, and so if you're moving and if you can, I would say have a plan that like that helps. Have a plan and as you come in, you know, and also just do your research. Where are you going? What are you going? What are you trying to do? What do you need for those things? So, yeah. And, um, and then as people come in too, it's always, I think, you get to understand the culture a little bit more as when you immerse yourself in it. 
So if you can immerse yourself, because there are times like maybe you might move and you have your relative and they guide you. So it might just, your scope might be narrow to what they've introduced you to. Mm-hmm. But like if you yourself like take the, the chance and just take the opportunity to kind of go in and see and immerse yourself, get to learn a bit more. I think it's, uh, it's beneficial that way. On me, it was forced on me in a way because I moved in and I had one person. So that everything I had to do, I had to really reach out and be out yeah. there, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, circumstances are different, but just um, I think have a plan understand what you need to do if you're coming in with qualifications maybe even reach out to evaluators before credential evaluators before you make the move and so you know exactly what prerequisites you need to take if you're coming on a a student visa like what what work opportunities would that give you while you're studying and so on And and then also if you can just save so when you come you know like if you can it's not always possible as we know back home like it's hard right so if you can save, you have something that just to cushion you as you come here to start off, it's, mm-hmm. it's worth it, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Living in a country where the system works, if, um, if our leaders could hear you right now, what would you say to them? Oh my goodness, uh, there's just so much, there's so much. Our leaders, one of the things, and I know that people realize the importance of these things, but just prioritizing them is what lasts. And so if we can prioritize education, use that as a springboard. Because a lot of times people say, well, no, if the government is not providing employment, you can go ahead and start a business and so on. You need capital to start a business. And most of the times you go to the banks, what do they say? Give us collateral. What collateral do you have as a student who just graduated from a poor family? Like you, so education is a sure bet. In Why do I say that? Because when you have an education, you have a platform, a springboard to get you started. Even if you're going into business or something like it gets you started. And then education, I don't mean um, like, you know, professional doctors, teachers, lawyers. Or, no, you can do vocational training. That is something that the government can provide. If there's ways that we could provide, you know, like right now, for example, in Zambia, and I'm hoping, you know, things have changed in the time I've been gone. But one of the things is, you have to get certain points in school to be able to qualify for certain loans and you know like education loans but i think it should be made so people can apply for different at different levels apply for different uh amounts and be able to get into school train in those programs you know like the way it is here right you can go to community college apply for financial aid and still get through school and then pay back when you're when you're done and educated and working okay leverage education and then build from there and then of course you know like with our families when you educate one person it's not just one you're supporting your cousins you're supporting your brothers you're supporting your sisters and it goes on so one what how how much more can we get if we actually educate 10 members of a family you know and and then um the other thing i would say is um take advantage of the brains that we have outside you know, like many Africans, if you ask, a lot of them who've come, left Africa, left home for opportunities abroad or have moved for whatever reason. Like at some point, many want to go back. They want to go back. They want to help. But there's usually a stigma when people go back. Like, oh, you've been gone too long. You're not in touch with what's happening. here. But somebody, you're missing out on a brain that has been exposed to so much more, which could come back and be used and then you know like i don't want to have an education go back home and not be able to find a job okay. or not be able to set up a business in a in a place that i can trust that the laws will say the same or that you know like i'll get the same help as maybe a big foreign company coming in will will be helped you know like so what can we do to make sure that we leverage because people have saved when they go back home they can start businesses but they'll need government help they can, you know, like support so much, so many more people. They can be people who can help with the education system, help with the road network system, help with the communication system, science, you know, so many things like we, why should we always be looking to what the West has developed in terms of, you know, like vaccines and so on. Like when we have medical personnel back home that we can utilize and people can do research even at home. So. Yeah, just leverage those brains. We have amazing brains back home, but people have lacked for various reasons, opportunities mostly. But if we can tap into that 
invite them back and make opportunities that are appealing for people to come back. That's yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much. I think it's just a great opportunity to just see share that love people to see what's happening in the diaspora and see that you know like we can do it in our small ways now or different ways we all doing something and then just um i think an opportunity to speak to our leaders back home that is on such a platform i think that's really really amazing so appreciate that and then uh yeah just encourage for me i think reading is big education is so important um so yeah let's just continue to i think you know like platforms like yours let's continue to support them and make sure that yeah like the the voices are heard and um keep sharing and also just yeah even if it's little advice to people who are planning to move and so on like mm-hmm. let's give that and then um yeah just read with your children and you know it might not always be possible but do the best that you can um you want to make a shout out to anyone before we go oh um yes of course i think i will um <laughs> Right now uh Lydia Yamaguchi is a big big inspiration. Yeah, she's um co pretty much co help, you know, co producing story time with Mr. Limada. So like the pictures you see, you know, some of the writing, there's uh, consultations that go on. She's been a big pillar of that. Um yeah, so Lydia big shout out to you. And then um <laughs> to you, Chizzy, thank you so much. You know, thank you. Chizzy as well. And then to my people in Lusaka, you know, my people in Zambia, you know, like Mulibwanji, thank you so much and it's just been great hearing from them. them as well and seeing that you know like this is appreciated yeah big shout out to my sister Sally and my friend Katota out there yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and the Zambia national soccer team hopefully we can win something again. yes <laughs> <laughs> all right peter thank you so much yeah you thank you so much thank you thank you and uh, keep uh, story time with mr limata keep it going and all the best thank all you the best. <laughs> thank you so much